Hey, everybody. I'm Chris Charbonneau, Charb the Barb, associate publisher of Fish Talk Magazine, here with my buddy, Lenny, the angler in chief. How you doing, Hello, Lenny? Chris. You doing? You doing all right? Um, um, no, I'm upset. But why? What's I'm going on? I'm very angry because I had a trip planned today, and I looked at the weather last night, and I saw a 68 percent chance of rain and thunderstorms, and I called it. And what happened? Nada. It's beautiful. Nada. It started raining an hour ago. I, right. I would have been back by now. Right. I'm pretty sure. Maybe not, but probably. Yeah, probably. Probably. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, for the uh, folks at home who have watched this before, I think they probably have noticed um, I'm not in my living room. Yeah, you're back at the office. Back at the office. Shocker. And the only place more boring than my living room is the office. <laughs> But um, yeah, but I got the the latest copy of Fish Talk behind me, and and we do have an exciting special announcement. We do, of course, we, we do. Have, we have a giveaway. So, as folks who have watched before know, you are free to type into the comments or on YouTube. You, I think you type it into something else, but you can type in your questions. Yep. Chris will bring them up on screen. We'll get your questions answered, and this time. There will be a lucky winner, somebody who asks a question. Chris will be putting all your names into a hat. At the end of the show tonight, he'll draw them, and somebody will win a copy of Hook, Line, and Slinker by Wayne Young. Which, nice. Yes, it's all about different wrecks, artificial reef spots, uh, on the bay, all kinds of very cool stuff. And, of course, those of you who read Fish Talk on a regular basis have already seen Wayne's articles. You know that his stuff is the real deal. We're, we're talking like, you know, underwater graphics showing exactly how a wreck lays and, and where it is on the charts and all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah. He's the how-to man. Yes. Yes. The where-to man. And where-to man. Yes. Nice. So very, very excited to give away a book this week. Uh, Chris will announce the winner at the end. And in the meantime, Chris, let's start talking fishing. Let's do it. I'm going to disappear because that's what I do. So today we're going to talk live lining. Now, anybody who's been paying a bit of attention to the fishing reports or who has been out there on the water knows that there's been a big shift to live lining in the last couple of weeks. Uh, you can see this picture here was taken right at the Bay Bridge. Uh, kind of your standard live lining fish, low 20-somethings. And uh, this was caught on a spot. You can see the circle hook right in its jaw. Of course, we got to point out that in Maryland waters, it is required that you use a circle hook. You, you cannot be live lining for rockfish with a J hook or a treble hook. And uh, people have gotten into trouble for that, folks. So, you know, dot your I's and cross your T's. Chris, would you go ahead and take me to the next slide, please? Now, here's your standard issue way, your, your uh, traditional method of catching your spot. You got a top and bottom rig. You want small hooks. Number six is about right. You're going to bait them up with bloodworms or little bits of fish bites. Uh, honest opinion, I think the bloodworms work better, but just by a little bit. And the truth of the matter is they're extraordinarily expensive. And on top of that, they make a big giant mess. The fish bites, eh, you know what? They're, they're, they're not super cheap, but they're a lot cheaper. They're clean. They're easy. You slice off a little bit. You put it on the hook. You put it down there. You're, you're going to catch your spot. Uh, I should point out that the spot have been in good numbers uh, in the mouth of the middle bay tributaries and the lower bay tributaries. Upper bay guys are still having a little bit of issue finding them. You might want to run down to like Hackett's. Hackett's has been a great place to find them lately. Um, but for the most part, they're around in, you know, pretty decent numbers. Uh, Chris, go ahead and take us to the next slide, please. Now, what you see here is a Chesapeake Sabiki rig. Um, I was on the big worm last year, and uh, this is Doug here. He whipped them out, and, man, we started whaling on fish left and right. I got to say, they work so well in comparison to the top and bottom. Still works great, but they work so well that I did go out, and I bought a bunch of these for myself. Uh, a couple quick things to point out about the Chesapeake Sabiki. You got to make sure it says it on the package, Chesapeake Sabiki, because your regular Sabiki rigs have, like, I don't know, 80 or 90 hooks on them. I mean, the things are just a Christmas tree of hooks. Uh, they're not legal in the state of Maryland. Now, if you're in Virginia, I believe you're okay to use them. But in the state of Maryland, 
you got to have the ones that are stamped Chesapeake. And I got to tell you, Virginia guys, I would still buy these things. You know why? A regular Sabiki rig with its 80,000 hooks on it, I mean, they stick to everything. You end up with them in your arm, your ear. You never know. They're in your clothes. They're incredibly sticky. These guys with just two hooks are a lot easier to handle. Now, you can fish these bare. You're going to catch more white perch than you are spot. I'm going to suggest you take that little, just the tiniest little piece of bloodworm or fish bites and stick it on that itty bitty little hook. You, you will catch more fish that way and you'll get a better ratio of spot to white perch. Fishing them bare. Uh, if you want to go perch fishing, fish them bare. You put like a one ounce weight on the bottom of that rig, drop it down to the bottom of your oyster bar, just give it a couple little jiggles and whew, those perch will slam them. Second thing I want to point out, you can see Doug's holding in his right hand that little D hooker tool. Now that's not a must have, all right? You can just take the fish off regularly. But those little D hookers with these Subikis and uh, with other, other rigs with small hooks, they work really, really well. It makes it a lot easier to get those bait fish off the hooks. Not the biggest deal in the world for most recreational guys, but if you're taking out a group of five, six friends, and you're the one who's gonna be de-hooking all those spot, and they're just gonna be reeling them in while you're de-hooking and throwing them in the live well, Believe me, that little de-hooker will save you a lot of pain. All right, Chris, take us on to the next slide, if you would. Now, this is something that I don't understand, okay? I don't get it. It seems to me that drifting with your sabiki or your bottom rig, you should catch more spot than if you anchor the boat up like these folks have. But for whatever reason, I don't know why, <laughs> anchoring just seems to work better. You just catch more spot. Just anchor the boat. Uh, what I do, what I tend to do is I might drift around a little bit if I don't already know where the spot are. And uh, once I catch one or two on the drift, then I'll drop the anchor. Um, and again, I, I don't know the why. I, it, it's one of those wacky things. But for whatever reason, when you drop the hook and then you drop down your rigs, you do end up catching more spot. All right, Chris, can we go on to the next? So here you see, this is again live lining at the Bay Bridges. You can see we're right on those, uh, the, the pilings. I like to call them spider pilings. They sit like that in the water. Um, uh, you can see that that's a fairly large spot on there, and it's not a really big fish, but we did catch some good fish that day. In fact, we got one over 30 inches that day. And these pilings were the trick. Now, if you're going to fish the bridge, uh, you're going to have a couple issues to deal with. Uh, the first is any of the pilings could hold, could hold fish, but kind of a select few hold more fish than the others. And those select few also hold more boats than the others. You, you will likely have a bunch of boats around all the good pilings. So this is tip number one for live lining. I mean, it's not even really a tip, but it's important people get out there as early as you possibly can. That may mean going fishing the afternoon before to load your live well up with those spot. The folks that can do that and then race out here, you know, basically in the very pre-dawn hours, they're the ones who are gonna get that, the best spots by these best pilings. Once you're on those spider pilings, flip that spot right in between the piles themselves. Put it right in there. Yeah, you're gonna tangle sometimes. Yeah, sometimes the fish is gonna grab it and wrap a piling and chafe it off. It's part of the game. Don't be upset. Just re-rig and pitch out another one. If you're not getting snagged on stuff, you're probably not, not right where the fish are. Now, I want to point out, recently, the best bite uh, has not been at the bridge. It's, it's held a bite. There have been some fish there. Um, but a couple hot spots have stood out recently. One has been the mouth of the Chester, Tolchester. That area the, of the upper bay has been hot. Eastern Bay has been holding some fish. The mouth of the chop tank has been holding some fish. Um, it hasn't been the easiest bite in the world, particularly during the midday hours. Once that sun's been getting up high in the sky and boats have been running around, the fish have been acting pretty darn spooky, honestly. Um, they've come on again in the evening after most of the folks have left and, uh, and it starts to cool off a little bit. Um, and some of the guys have been jigging around some of these live lining spots and having a really tough time too. It, it's it's been a little difficult. Now, these storms that are moving through now, uh, they may shake things up a little bit. Hopefully they will. Uh, but again, getting out there really early right now is key. And if you want to do that when you're live lining, you really got to catch the the, per, the spot the day before. 
uh, catching them the day of is probably not going to do it for you. All right, go to the next slide, will you please? Okay, so make that big, will you, Chris? I can barely see what I want to talk about. <laughs> Thank you. So here's Kohler. Kohler caught up a couple rockfish, had a good day there. I want you to notice two things. The first is in the background to his, I guess it would be his right, but looking at the screen, it's my left. Uh, you can see lots of boats in the background. Um, a lot of times, the good live lining spots, they are holding a fleet of boats. It's one of those things you got to deal with. A lot of guys make a tragic error. Tragic. They run towards the fleet. They get to its periphery. They figure, I'm close enough. And they drop the anchor, and they don't catch any fish, and they wonder what the heck the deal is. Do not do that, people. Okay? When you first get to a big fleet of boats, you want to circle around it. You want to keep an eye on your meter. You want to keep an eye on not just for fish, but you also want to keep an eye out for the depth. Because what you're going to find is somewhere in that pack, there's going to almost certainly going to be a contour. And that contour is probably what the fish are sitting on. And in all likelihood, what happened was at 6 o'clock in the morning, three, four, five, six charter boats anchored up along that contour. And then a gazillion boats came running from down south, came running from west, came running from the north. They all went and anchored in a big giant ball all around those charter boats who were anchored on the contour. Well, everybody watches the charter boats catching the fish, and they go, my gosh, what am I doing wrong? I'm not catching any fish. The charter boats catch all their fish, and then they go home, and everybody's like, oh, my gosh, what am I doing wrong? Uh, what a lot of people are doing wrong is they're just arriving at the pack and dropping the anchor. Circle it. Look for that contour. While you're doing so, look for fish. If you see a big bunch of fish, great. Stop the boat, drop the hook, get those spot right over the side. If you don't, keep looking. At least find the contour with some fish on it. Uh, all right, Chris, make it big one more time, please. Big, 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 big. Okay. Uh, was that the next? Oh, I already did. I did it in the next slide, and now I'm just confusing Chris. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Thank you. Okay. So what I wanted to show you here is if you look in the left-hand side amongst all those boats, you can see an egg sinker swinging around. That's like an ounce or so. Uh, this is how I like to weight my live baits. Actually, this is what I like to do when I'm chumming, too. Run the line through an egg sinker tile and a ball bearing swivel. Not a cheap barrel swivel, a ball bearing swivel. Yes, I know they cost like a buck seventy-five each. It's painful to buy them, but the barrel swivels do not keep the twist out of the line. And if something starts spinning there, you you want that ball bearing in there. Then you've got a three foot to four foot stretch of thirty pound fluorocarbon, and on the end of that, you got your circle hook. Uh, I should mention bigger is better when it comes to circle hooks for rockfish. If you're using six aughts, you're going to be gut hooking fish. If you're using eight aughts, they don't get them down their gut nearly as often. And ten aughts, even though they look huge for these fish, really are not out of line. I, I would encourage using them, particularly if you have undersized fish around that you really don't want getting those hooks down their gullet. Uh, and, and yeah, when a rockfish takes a circle hook down its gullet, it, it can still get gut hooked. I mean, don't you know, don't think it'll never happen. Uh, so the other thing I want to mention about the weight, sometimes you want that weight, you want to put them down deep, sometimes you don't. And recently, the recent bite has been on either very little weight or no weight at all. Uh, when you're fishing no weight at all, put your circle hook in front of the spot's dorsal, okay, in its back, just in front of its dorsal. That will get it swimming like this into the current, um, and, and give a natural presentation. When there's no current, you can back hook them behind the dorsal through the tail. But if you got any kind of current running, don't do that because they'll end up backwards in the current looking unnatural. Um, so why would you do it in the first place? When you hook them behind the dorsal, it does encourage them to swim down. And if the fish are on bottom and you have an unweighted line rigged up and you want to make sure that spot goes down to the bottom, just switch it up, go right behind the, the dorsal, again, as long as there's no current, and he'll go straight down. Uh, what if the fish are up top? Hook them through the nose. When you hook the spot through the nose, they like to stay up top. Um, if you're going down to the bottom in a strong current, I also go through the nose. And the reason there is uh, they can just swim right with the current, and they live longer. They, they last better. Okay, let's go on to the next one here, Chris. Okay, so here... See how this spot looks kind of ragged? He's missing some scales. Um, he's been hit. And this is, this is probably the biggest mistake number two that people make when they're live lining for rockfish. They're using a spot 
they get a hit, but the line doesn't come tight. And they go, oh, oh, well. And they start to reel it up. And they see the spot on the end of the line. And he's still swimming. He's still alive. And they let it right back out. Uh-uh. Nope. Doesn't work. Uh, I mean, it works. You catch a fish here and there. But it's not the way to fish. What happens is as soon as these spot lose some scales, and everyone just calls it as soon as they get scaled, um, all it takes is one hit to do it. They're going to lose a patch of scales. For whatever reason, the rockfish are not nearly as interested. I mean, their interest level plummets. We're talking 70, 80 uh, percent. And if you put on a brand new spot and pitch it out, it might get hit, boom, right away. Uh, if you put out, leave out that spot that's been hit and has been scaled, you might sit there 20 minutes until he gets hit again. Or he might not get hit again at all. Um, this is why when you go spot fishing, you want to get like at least eight or 10 spot per angler. You really need that many. And as soon as you get a hit and it doesn't come tight, reel it in, take that spot off, pitch them over the side, stick on a new one. You really go through spot doing that. But if you want to catch fish, that's what you got to do because they just don't like it. The, the rockfish just don't like it once they've spotted them and scaled. All right, Chris, take us on to the next one, will you? All right, so. This slide, I got nothing to say here that's going to help you catch more fish, but it's very important. Look at the mesh on that net. You can see this is a rubber covered mesh, okay? If your net on your boat is a knotted nylon mesh and not this type of rubber coated mesh, I want you to start feeling guilty. I don't want you to go fishing again until you replace that net, okay? Look. We all used to use them. These days, we know better. There's not that knotted nylon rubs the slime off the fish when you lift it out of the water. If that fish is a throwback, you've radically decreased its chances of survival. And this is really important, particularly with rockfish right now, which are under way too much pressure. We, you know, catch fish, take them home, eat them. God bless you, but let's not waste them, right? Let's not waste them. So uh, if you've got that knotted nylon on your boat right now, please, 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 before the weekend, run by your local tackle shop and grab a net that's got the rubber coated mesh. It is just so much easier on the fish and it, it's really something that needs to be done. Uh, Chris, you wanna take us over to the next slide? Okay, so look, you can tell that's not a very big rockfish, right? It's not even close to a keeper. That's your throwback. That was caught on like a four inch spot. It is shocking how small of a rockfish can get its mouth around how big of a spot. Um, this fish was thrown back. Fortunately, it was in fine shape. But again, we really don't want to waste these fish. And don't think for a minute that when, because you're putting out a spot that big, you're not going to get bit by an undersized rockfish. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. It's absolutely, you can put a six inch spot out there. Sooner or later, you're gonna have an 18 and a half inch rockfish that should be released chomping down on that six inch spot. So uh, I just wanna reiterate, big circle hook, not little. Six outs too small. A lot of guys use it, too small. You're gonna gut hook fish and, and you're gonna realize this. But you know, if you don't listen to me now, when you see the fish bleeding, you're, that's, that's when you're gonna figure it out. So upsize those hooks, A dot minimum, 10 dot good, okay? Um, it, it is true that the best way to actually set those hooks is just to stick your rod in the holder and ignore it. Don't pick it up until it's bent over, okay? By then, the rockfish has already set the hook in it itself. Um, if you pick up the rod at the first indication of a nibble and feed it on a free spool, Will you catch more fish? Yeah, yeah, you probably will. And I'm saying don't do it because you're also going to gut hook more. Uh, the longer you give that fish, the better a chance it's going to be gut hooked. You'll you'll catch more. You'll miss fewer strikes if you if you feed it. You will, um, but you're going to gut hook more fish. And and again, we got to be really careful about how we're dealing with rockfish right now. So bigger hook. Uh, Stick it in the holder as soon as it bends, pick it up. Don't feed it, which, of course, is, you know, 
five years ago, I would have been sitting here saying, oh, yeah, feed it for a five count and then set the hook. Well, it's just different now. Um, and uh, the other piece of this puzzle, uh, well, get the net and get the net. And the other piece of this puzzle is um, if you're catching throwback after throwback, I hate to say it, it's painful to do. It might be time to move, right? If you're catching 16 incher after 16 incher, you're probably not going to get that 26 incher. You might want to pull the anchor and try another spot. Um, just banging on those throwbacks right now is particularly with live baits is not something we want to be doing. If you're fishing jigs, it's not as hard on the fish. Um, it's less painful. Uh, but you know, still, I still recommend if you're catching throwback after throwback after throwback, you, you might want to just move, find a different spot. Uh, Chris, where are we, where are we at on the question front here? Has anybody chimed in any questions as of yet? Uh, yeah. Hold on one second, Lenny. Um, okay. Oh, I lost the picture of you. You are now a circle with a little person icon. Oh, there you are. You can see me now. I just figured I was going to just hide behind. Um, yeah, so we got a few questions. Um, let me just kind of go scroll up here. I'll try. I like to try and do an order, but here we go. Um, there we go. We got Matt He's way up north. What's the best place to catch spot? I live way up north to fish out of the bush. You are way up north, Matt. <laughs> um, so at the moment, here's what I'd say. Right like tomorrow, you're going fishing tomorrow. I think you'd have to run down to about the Magathy before you'd have the numbers of spot that you want to catch bait. Might even have to go below the bridge and hit Hackett's. You catch some at Love Point, but you know you, you could end up spending half the day to catch enough spots to rockfish with. But but, 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 you're far enough north that there aren't a ton of spot up there yet. Catch white perch. Use little white perch. Little white perch work darn close to as good as spot. I'm not going to say quite as good, but darn close. And up in that area, the rockfish haven't been seeing spot, so they're not going to be focused in on them. I, I would absolutely positively go catch some white perch. Let's see, Dave, have you used gulp bloodworms to catch spot? Interesting question. I personally have not tried them. I have seen them. I have not tried them. And so I can't answer that question. Well, I mean, I did just answer it, but I can't answer how effective they are. But I'm going to say right now, anybody who's watching, if you have used the gulp bloodworms one spot, please chime in in the comments. And Chris, if you'll just kind of keep an eye out, and if somebody chimes in, give us an update, will you? Where do you hook a perch to get it to swim down? They swim swim up compared to a spot. Okay, yep. So it is a kind of a general thing. If you hook them right behind the dorsal, uh, any bait fish, it's usually true. Hook them right behind the dorsal. They want to go like this. They kind of swim against the pole, right? So they want to go down like that. So that's where you want to hook them. If you're trying to go without weight, um, you want to give like – you don't want to put tension on the line, but just the – least tiniest little bit of resistance kind of so they still know they're swimming against something and they'll try and get down and then um, normally if I'm having trouble keeping a bait down uh, if I don't have something rigged and I don't want to re-rig I'll reach for a rubber core right you've probably seen these little rubber core sinkers uh, they have a slot little piece of rubber in the middle you twist them I don't think I'm any sitting on my desk right now I don't they're all down on the boat um, but it's it you can put it on like that right you don't have to re-rig uh, sure that cut the line stick on white I was just gonna say I think this you already answered this but I'm gonna bring it up anyway and use perch for live lining Scott absolutely yeah we did already talk about that but you know I mean that's a big point so um, it, it depends on where the rockfish are and what they're keyed in on uh, up on the flats this whole time we've been live lining a spot down here and before Right before anybody was live lining in the lower upper middle or lower bay, <clears throat> there were lots of guys who were live lining up on the Susquehanna Flats, and they were all using white perch. I mean, that's what they were all doing. In fact, uh, we heard we had it was in the reports a couple weeks ago for the way north. Um, 
a guy, he advertised with us for a while, the guy who makes the ghost drag. Remember the ghost drag? It's a little clip that goes on your rod, and it has a little tensioner clip on there. And you clip it on your rod, and then you put your line in the clip, and you set the tension real, real loose, and it just holds your line there. And then when a fish takes it, it just pops out, and then it's free spooled. So it's, it's a great way to get free spool uh, without letting the line spill out on a spinning rod that doesn't have a bait runner. Or if you have a conventional rod that has a clicker, you know, that would normally be what you would use, but this would provide even less tension. And he sent pictures a couple couple weeks in a row right after the season opened. And he's way up north, so he's fishing up on the flats, and he was live lining white perch the whole entire time. Cool. Our next question comes from our very own Eric Packer. Eric. Hey, Eric, how you doing? And, and Eric, I, I got I to tell Eric, you're disqualified automatically for the raffle. For the, <laughs> just, sorry. It's yes, Eric cool. is a regular contributor to Fish Talk, so it, it would not be appropriate for no. him to win the prize. Okay. And, and he starts off by saying, I'm not a live bait guy. Uh, no, you're not. <laughs> So if I spot the fleet, paddle over, find the fish, then start casting jigs, what do you feel my percentage of catching would be to compared to live lining on the same school? Well, that is a really interesting question. Um, and I think it's going to vary from day to day. I think it'll vary a lot depending on how mobile the fish are, right? Because when they ball up on an edge or structure and they're just sticking right there and they're not moving, if you're live lining and you anchor your boat right on top of them, you can just whale on them. I mean, you can limit out like that. Um, on the flip side, if the schools are mobile, they're, they're moving up and down a shoal or they're, you know, scattered along an oyster bar. In that case, I think the jigger's got a leg up, right? Cause you're mobile. You're constantly moving. You can move the boat till you see them on the meter. Stop, get your jigs right on them. Or you can drift along an edge and jig along it. So I'm saying it depends. Um, I don't think there's a solid answer there. I think it depends on what the fish are doing. Now, I will say that for you, Eric Packard, since I know how you fish, you jig an awful lot, you're probably better off jigging anyway because you're doing what you know how to do. But if you take the average anger, angler who probably doesn't have quite the same feel as you do for, say, bouncing a jig along bottom in 25 feet of water and getting it right where you want it and giving it that action that's just so, but you have to tick bottom every time, little, little technical, right? The average angler is probably going to catch more fish live lining like this. Because, I mean, let's face it, you put the hook through the spot, you drop the spot. If the rockfish are hungry, they're eating it. So, I mean, it, it's not nearly as intense, I don't think, as the jigging. So you, Eric, you just keep on jigging, okay? You keep on jigging. Leave those poor little spot alone. Yeah, that sounds like a bumper sticker. Keep on jigging. Yeah. Anyway, Todd Lester, he wants a big rubberized net. Recommendations on finding a large rubberized net. Oh, dude, I so got you covered. Uh, so um, I got a net specifically designed for cobia two years ago which has the mesh it's ginormous it's about this big and of course most folks probably know there you know there's some regulations about gaffing cobia you can't gaff a cobia in the bay you got to net it uh, and when you're netting a keep, keeper cobia in the bay is 40 inches or bigger when you're netting a 40 inch cobia i don't care what you do something is likely to break like you bring it into the boat and it's going to like bust your under, under gunnel rod racks out or kick somebody, something bad is going to happen. Um, so I went on the hunt for the best, biggest, bestest net I could possibly find. I got it. I used it in the second season. Uh, my daughter's boyfriend net a big cobia, hauled it up over the side, and it went crazy and broke the net. So you think, oh, my God, well, that sucks and that broke. But not really. Because I emailed the Norseman guys and they had a new net in the mail to me in a matter of hours. So you can't beat the net. It comes with a lifetime guarantee. It is not cheap. I'm going to have to do some typing over here to make sure I give you the right name. 
Norseman Outdoors is the company, and the Stowmaster is the name of the model line of the net. The Norseman Outdoors Stowmaster. And if you look at them, you'll see the Cobia version. And I think it's Cobia and Redfish. But you'll see the Big Fish version. And uh, truth be told, A, these guys totally lived up to their name, in my opinion, because they replaced that net instantaneously. B, that was the probably the 20th keeper size plus Cobia that I had brought in the boat. It was fine with all the others. And C, uh, I think my daughter's boyfriend might have levered it. And I think that might be why there was some net damage. Like, I'm not trying to lay blame, but I think he may have levered it on the side of the boat instead of, you know, properly scooping and then hand over handing up like this. When you got a fish that big, you know, <laughs> I don't care what you did it with, you got to treat it right or something's going to break. But that's the net. Norseman Outdoors, Stowmaster Cobia. You know, Lenny, we might. You should call them and see if we can't get a giveaway for the next time we talk about Cobia. That would be cool. Yeah. That would be very cool. You just gave them one heck of an endorsement right there anyway. Hey, you know what? I mean, look, they're, they're not advertisers with us or anything, yeah. but they not yet. They, they make a great product and they lived up to their guarantee. I mean, what more could you want, you know? There you go. Well, Fred's oh, going to go. Fred. Fred, I'm so sorry we didn't go fishing today. Ugh. Uh, I could kill the weatherman. That's another story. Is there anyone that makes a circle hook with a thinner wire? My tenot looks like they would pull in a shark. Fred, you're right. <laughs> um, that is how a tenot looks. It's gen like it's a tuna hook, basically, right? Um, you know, offhand, brand wise, I am not a thousand percent sure. I got to do some looking. Um, I, we know each other. I'll email you. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to beg out on that. I don't want to say the wrong thing, and I could spend ten minutes googling. But there are some. There are some. But you got to look for them. They got to be the right ones. You know, 10, 15 years ago, there were like three circle circle hooks on the market, and they all look like they were pulling a shark. Um, in the last maybe twenty years ago, in, in the last decade or two, uh, there's become a lot more variety. There are a lot more different ones now, and um, you, you, they're out there, but I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that. And I'll punch it into the comments so that anybody watching this can go back and look. All right. Another question from Dave. Do you cut the back spines off white perch to get straight perch to take the perch? That is something that I have done and that, honestly, I wouldn't bother doing. You know, it, it is. it makes sense. It's something that I have done before. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but I've come to find that they really, it doesn't, it doesn't bother them. If you think about it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, they're in the wild, they're eating these fish anyway. So I guess, you know, there's white perch spines, man. They'll, they'll hurt you. <laughs> they'll, they'll hurt, they're, they'll, if they stick you, they'll hurt you big time. But I guess the rockfish are used to dealing with it, you know? And you know what? If it makes you feel better, Take a pair of scissors, snip those spines off. I don't think it's going to hurt anything. It does not seem to shorten the lifespan of the of the white perch at all. Cool. All right, question from Anthony. How come fish don't hang out around the Patuxent River Bridge? Who said they didn't? <laughs> I don't recall saying that. Uh, contributor Eric Packard, who fishes the Patuxent all the time, would you like to chime in on this? Because I know exactly what you'll say. <laughs> um, <laughs> They do. If you think they don't, I, I suspect I know the issue, okay? Those pilings out in the middle of the river are in, like, uber deep water. They're not really where you want to be fishing. Um, and, and, and Eric, please don't hate me for, for talking specifics here, uh, but the pilings close <laughs> – right. The pilings closer to the shoreline are the ones that you really want to be fishing. It's actually the, like the last two or three on the, oh, I don't want to get this wrong, uh, the St. Mary side, not the Salmon side, in my, in my experience, have been the best, the, those last two or three. On the other side, you'll, you'll catch fish on the other ones close to shore too. But the thing is, they're in that zone of water, you know, 35 feet up to five feet. They're in that transition zone where the fish like to feed. 
those other pilings out in the middle, they're really super deep. Uh, and I, you know, Eric, stop me if I'm wrong, but I've never done much on those particular pilings. Uh, you'll get rock on the ones closer in, and you'll get white perch on the ones closer in. And in the late fall, sometimes you can go up next to one of those pilings and just destroy the white perch. I mean, you can load your box. Obviously, be judicious, but, you know, the fish are there. All right. Gary. All right. If you don't have a boat, what is your best suggestion north of Annapolis or just over the Bay Bridge? I'm going to assume here you mean for rockfish. Um, and since we're talking live lining, I'm going to assume you mean for the live lining gig. Uh, what I would say is, excuse me, I'm going to give you a couple suggestions. The first is go to Mattapeak. Take a couple rods. Take a big rod. Take a small rod. Rig your small rod for the spot. Cast it out, catch some perch. Or I'm sorry, some, some spot. Lean up that big rod. Don't even use it, but have it rigged and ready for the rockfish. As soon as you reel in a spot on that little rod, literally take him off the hook, take the hook on your big rod, your, your eight out, 10 out circle hook, slide it through that spot, flip him right back out there. Right back out there. Um, that's a good way to catch a rockfish. You could do the same thing uh, over at Kent Narrows. It'll work there. Let's see. Uh, north of Annapolis. There's not much good shrub. I mean, Sandy Point is an obvious answer. And, and Sandy Point can be a good spot. Uh, the problem is it is so dang crowded. You, you're, if you're fishing early, you're fishing late, or you're fishing a weekday, go to Sandy Point. Otherwise, you're going like, to have to elbow people out of the way to, to get enough room you know, to cast. And you're going to want to go out to that jetty. That's probably the best spot at this time of year. They were doing really well earlier in the year off the beach. Um, but I haven't heard of that producing lately. So you're going to be at the jetty, which means you, it's going to be hard to find a spot. All right, so other spots further north. Let's see. Hmm, Zach, I want you to feel free to chime in if you're watching right now and you have any thoughts. Um, I, I, man, head from Mattapeak, you know. Uh, you know, up north, uh, there are a couple of public piers um, at public parks that I'm blanking on uh, that have potential here. Okay, so here's what you do. Google uh, Maryland DNR public access fishing map. There, the Maryland DNR has a, a very easy to find public access map that has all the different piers. And the piers that are escaping me that are up north, we're talking like there's one, I think just north of Bodkin. Um, and there's one oh, farther up. Um, those piers will all be on the public access map. And if you just Google Maryland DNR public access fishing spots map, it'll pop right up. They, they, the DNR actually does a pretty darn good job with this map. And it's interactive, and you just hover over it and click on it, and it'll tell you all the ins and outs of all these different spots. Well, it's funny. Gary says he doesn't have a boat, so I think he's in the market. He wants to know what it's like <laughs> and type. Gary, the answer, the honest answer to that question is whatever dang boat you can afford. <laughs> Seriously. You know what? Don't, a little 14-foot aluminum boat is awesome in the tribs. It really is. You won't go out in the main bay, but in the tribs, oh, my God, it's inexpensive. It's easy to trailer. It's just a ton of fun. 14 footer is great. 16 footer, a little more beef. Uh, you get up into the 21 foot center console range. You got a lot of choices in there. You know, your Sportsman's, your Key West, that type of boat. Um, that then you have kind of full bay flexibility. So if you really want to have full Chesapeake Bay access, 21 foot is is probably about the minimum of where you want to be. 23, 24 foot. You'll feel a little better when the winds kick up, you know. You won't you won't get beat up or wet quite so much. Um, and, and but 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 honestly, you know, I I have a 16 foot crabbing skiff. It doesn't go in the bay. On rare occasions, it goes into the bay. Generally, it doesn't go into the bay. It's something I use in the river. Half the time, I have just as much fun on that boat as I do on my glacier bay. I do. It's just so much fun. 
So I don't, you know, I don't think there's a solid answer to that question that goes beyond whatever bay, boat you can afford and you like, you know, find a boat you like. All right. We're moving oh, on. Wait, 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 wait. What? Before we move on, Chris, can right. I, make a plug? I suggest going to fishtalkmag.com oh, and click yeah. on the boat reviews and you will have literally hundreds of boat reviews you can check through and something there will be a boat that you like. I hope. Definitely. All right. Jonathan. Why do you believe the live line hotspots change year to year? Do you think simply overfishing pressure one year decreases the bite the following year? It's interesting for me that the hot live line spots have changed each of the last three years. Okay, so big topic, Jonathan. Big topic, important topic. <laughs> I'll get a little sip of the red there first. <clears throat> so I can't tell you the why. I'm not a biologist. I'm not sure the biologists would know exactly why. But what I can tell you is all the spots change year to year. Okay. If you read Rudo's Guide to Fishing the Chesapeake, right, which was one of my one of my earliest books. A lot of guys out there have it. As I identify hot spots, I never say this is the spot to go. I always say this is a really good spot. It's hot like one in three years. This is a pretty good spot. It's hot like one in five years. This is a good spot to check out. It's hot like one in 10 years. Fish move. Fish move, you know, and whether it's pressure or they eat all the critters in a particular spot at a given time and then move on, whatever, it always changes year to year. It always changes season to season. I'll tell you what, when I was in my 30s, the hill at the mouth of Eastern Bay, there was always a flotilla of boats anchored up there. I mean, every dang time you went fishing, it was the spot to go. Boats came from all around. They came from the upper bay. They came from the lower bay. They went to the hill. Today, eh, a couple weeks out of the year, you might see a few boats there. Trollers pass across it. It's, it's like not the hot spot anymore. Um, and, it's, and we're not just talking about live lining here. This goes for jigging, trolling. I don't care what you do. There's some areas that just sort of tend to be good more than others, and there are some areas that don't. But no area, there is no one spot that is always good. Look, look at the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, right? There is no, no structure, anything like that, until you go all the way down to the CBBT, right? That's the next nearest, CBBT. It's not always good fishing. <laughs> the fish are not always there. They're there a lot. They're there a lot more than at a lot of other spots, but they're not always there. So um, it, it, expect that. That's natural. That's natural. My opinion. All right. Next one from Team Coastal. Best color for trolling over the past week. So <clears throat> really going clear back to trophy time. Uh, this year so far, much like a lot of last year, if it ain't white, it ain't right. White has been the color du jour for rockfish. Um, now, I would expect that that may be shifting. I would look for chartreuse to, to get a little better in the near future. And I say that because over the past week, 10 days, we've had a ton of wind. We had these storms rolling through in the middle bay zone today. Um, as that water gets churned up and a little bit less clear and it gets hotter and a little more algae grows and it's not as clear, uh, just as a kind of a general thing, chartreuse usually tends to pick up. As that water gets greener, chartreuse picks up. When, when it's more clear, the light is going to be a better bet. Uh, in your low light conditions, you want to go to your purples. Okay, go to your purples, your avocados, that kind of thing. Um, I have not heard anything other than white in the reports as of yet. I have not found anything better as of yet, but but it should be shifting. I would expect it to be changed. Don't forget your general rule of thumb when it comes to lure color. Always live by this. When you first look around, match your lure color to the lure color. If it's clear, use white. If it's green water, reach for chartreuse or lime, right? Sometimes yellow. Uh, 
tannic water, when you're in a tannic stain tributary and you want and you're bass fishing, try root beer. Believe me, try root beer. It's it seems a little weird, uh, you know. And, and again, I'm not a biologist; I can't explain the why. But try matching your lure color, your water color, and that that like almost always works out. Nighttime, what color is water? It's black. Guess what? Black is a great color at night. The the, the rule, you know, not 100, percent but it holds a lot of the time. All right. I was once told when using white perch for live line, you should cut off part of the dorsal fin. Thoughts? Okay, so we already. I think we already talked about this a little bit. Uh, I, I have done it. Um, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, it may help a little bit. I don't. I couldn't. I can't really tell the difference, honestly. I can't tell much of a difference. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, let's see. I, I guess you'd be happy when you grab that white person. He doesn't spine you because I know that that hurts. <laughs> Um, Tom wants to know if it's better to do uh, live line and by Thomas Point. <clears throat> At this time, better live line Thomas Point or North of the Bay Bridge? Well, so, man, it's, it's rapidly changing. There was a great live lining bite at the mouth of the Chester. It got pounded last week. Well, okay, well, let's back up. There was a great bite at Gum Thickets. So down, you know, just across from Thomas Point. They got pounded by boats. The fish moved. Uh, the fish went up north. There was a great bite in the mouth of the Chester. Fish got pounded. The fish moved. Now we also, interestingly, I was putting together the fishing the, our weekly fishing reports today. Uh, if anybody doesn't get them, go to fishtalkmag.com, click on the button to sign up for them. You'll get an email every Friday at noon, alerting you to the fact that the new fishing reports are up. Uh, but something interesting that I came across in the reports as I went through them today, um, evidently a lot of dolphin have been sighted in the Bay Bridge area. And a lot of the fish have pushed way north. Now, they did this last year around this time, too. I think a little later. But, um, you know, some people are theorizing that perhaps because the dolphin have pushed so far up, now the rockfish are kind of running away from them, and they're going farther north. Uh, Tolchester came up over and over again. But that said, while that body of fish was up there getting pounded on and getting hard to get to bite, there have also been fish in Eastern Bay. There's a good number of rockfish in Eastern Bay right now. Um, so at this time, is it better at a live line, Thomas Point or North of the Bay Bridge? Probably North of the Bay Bridge, unless you want to go to Eastern Bay. <laughs> I haven't heard a ton from Thomas Point. We did, it was in the reports. I want to say it came, came from all tackle anglers or there was one other tackle shop in there. I forget which might've been Tockerman's, uh, that mentioned, a bite at Thomas Point. I haven't personally encountered it. Uh, I I haven't tried. I haven't live lined Thomas Point. Um, honestly, you know that's it's that's my backyard. So if I'm going to Thomas Point, I'm chucking jigs. It's probably six o'clock in the evening. When I get out, when we're done here, the first thing I'm doing is I'm checking the weather. And if those thunderstorms are all gone, I'm running down to the boat, and I'll see you at Thomas Point. <laughs> that's um. A <laughs> Hot spot to Sandy Point. Okay, Justin, what you want is pedicory, right? Uh, leave Sandy Point, hang a left, go around the lighthouse, uh, look at your charts. You'll see the contour where it drops down 15 to 22, 25 off pedicory point. That's the general zone that, that is closest right there. And that's a really good area. It came up a little bit in the reports this week, not a ton. Um, but as a rule of thumb, that's a really good, that's a really good zone. Man, you catch a lot of fish or something. In fact, the picture we used earlier uh, that had Kohler in it, where he's holding up the two fish, you can see all the boats in the background behind his shoulder. That was a pedicory. Well, there you go. Yeah. Uh, the lighthouse might be in the background somewhere. Uh, you mentioned this earlier. Wayne didn't catch the name of the company. Was it uh, Norseman? Norseman Outdoors. It's still up on the screen. I didn't clock. I, I didn't click it out because I was. I was trying not to be impolite and look away. Uh, yeah, Norseman Outdoors, it's the Stowmaster Net. Okay. Stowmaster. And you covered this earlier, but I just wanted to bring it up again because I thought. Ah, uh, anchor or drift and live lining. Yeah. Yeah, man, you want to anchor it up. Uh, it, it seems like drifting would be the better move. Uh, years of hard headedness and refusing to anchor, and then finally giving it an anchoring, 
have proven that yes, you catch more spotted anchor than you do drifting. Yeah. Um, I'll generally drift just a little bit, locate some spot, and then once I've located them, drop the hook. And then I'm then I'm anchoring. You you, have, it, it, you just catch them quicker that way. I don't know why. Yeah. Uh, let's see. And last but not least, we're going to ask here from Chris Gonzalez. Any thoughts on the Potomac? Yeah, so um, the reports coming out of the Potomac have been from down in St. George's, uh, the, the contour. I guess that would be southeast. The contour southeast of St. George's has been a good contour. Um, we heard a little bit from the Virginia guys from Smith Point, not a whole lot down there. Um, and I think I haven't checked the dates, but their season is about to go out. I'm pretty sure. Um, Got to check on that. Not the Potomac, but the Virginia. Um, that's really about all I've heard from the Potomac. You know, more guys down Potomac way, <clears throat> excuse me, have been kind of grooving on this spec thing lately because there have been a lot more specs around than normal, you know, particularly for this early in the year. And a lot of folks are going out and targeting them. Now, I know Eric, uh, Eric, our contributor who was on earlier, um, he went, he casted the shallows in the Patuxent, which, of course, is a very, you know, similar water, uh, this week and found it oddly, oddly slow. He didn't get any specs and he saw rockfish floaters, which is a very bad sign. Hopefully it was an anomaly. I don't know. But if I was going to go fish the Potomac tomorrow, uh, I'd, I'd be looking on that contour off of St. George's Island if I was going to live line. If I was going to jig, actually, honestly, look in the same exact place. I'd just move around more and look for the fish more, you know, as, a, as I did so. All right. We, uh, we've got one more, and it's from our own Bob. Hey, and Bob. What's happening? Bob, we got to go fishing. It's been way too long. Um, and I know that's my fault. Uh, when will the blues and Spanish mackerel move in? Oh man, I, you know, uh, 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 I mean, shucks, <laughs> Bob, you're asking me a hard question. Um, I can't I the exact I, date. <laughs> I can't tell you. You know, it should be soonish on the blues and a little laterish on the mac. Now the mackerel are already in at the mouth of the bay. Down CBBT way, they're catching them inside the bridge tunnel complex, which is great. It's great. If they wanted to, they could be here in days. More commonly, uh, they don't really show up until, you know, early, mid-July-ish for us up here. I'd say that would be common, okay? But they could show up, you know, heck, man, they could be here before June ends. Who knows? Uh, the blues usually move in just in front of them. So the blues, I'll bet people start picking them up scattered in the in the middle bay zone any day now any day now scattered not big numbers um and then the numbers will grow and grow and grow and uh by the time the mac move in there'll probably be so many blues around you're like oh my god i can't get away from these blue fish they're biting through everything <laughs> all right um and and the same rule applies uh for uh oh yeah don't put, don't put bob's hat bob your name can't go in the hat that's right. Sorry, Bob. Not go in the hat. Bob is officially linkified to Fish right. Magazine. And just to clarify, in case anybody is wondering, um, if you ask more than one question that we use, you still only get one opportunity to be in the fishbowl. Um, and I've, I've got our winner already, uh, Mr. Gary Fick. And I, oh. and I have to say, he asked a couple of questions, but he's, I mean, I have to assume he's uh, in the market for a boat. The book is appropriate. You can tell him where to go. Absolutely. So, Gary, just email me. My email is incredibly simple. It's all over fishtalkmag.com. It's Lenny at fishtalkmag.com. Yeah. So it doesn't yeah. get much easier than that. And if you can't remember it, just go to the Fish Talk website. And uh, my email is on there somewhere. I don't even know yeah. where. It's on there somewhere. I'm absolutely sure of it. Yeah. There's no excuse for not getting a hold of us. That's uh, right. <laughs> so congrats to him. And uh, I'm, I think I'm going to just call this one because. Uh, Holy mackerel, it's almost 6 o'clock. It's almost 6 o'clock. So um, many. 
I'm a, oh, it's raining. Is it? I think it's going to end soon now. I, I got to look. I got to take another look at the radar. But um, I didn't. I didn't want to hold you up. I wanted you to get out there. Yeah, no, that's good. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm checking the radar as soon as we're done. Cool. Well, we had a great audience. Uh, lots of great questions too. Um, so thank everybody for uh, you know for joining in. Um, we'll do this again in a month's time. Uh, until then, uh, you know, get out there, do some fishing. Not a problem, Chris. That's going to happen. See you, everybody.